Okay, there you go with your clack. Have you been? Yeah. Are the glasses okay? Yeah. Put the sticks? No, one second, one second. Take them away. Three cameras A and B, common mark. Three cameras A and B. There's three types of people oh, in yeah. the world. Those that can count and those that can't. <laughs> what? There are three types of people in the world. I see. Those who can count and those that can't. <laughs> I see. <laughs> what happened to Michael? Oh, I see. You're full of funny, good jokes. I could hope I can remember them. That's a neat one. Okay, so, so again, let's just keep hammering it in the same way. Can you just tell us... Uh, uh, what continuity you find in your life work uh, uh, in this exploration of what it is to be human and what 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 is a human being? Yeah, I, I'm just trying to figure out how to start. Uh, so from the beginning, my reading of these philosophers and my teaching and my research has all been a response to a certain calling, which I wasn't aware of. You don't need to really be aware of your calling. But, uh, but I was more and more uh, unhappy with the way philosophy had uh, covered up, it seemed, something and made life seem banal and meaningless or mechanical or, or so dependent on some supreme being that it didn't have any, so to speak, life of its own. And so, what, so and Heidegger, was what led me to begin to see the criticism of the current, uh, what he would call the current understanding of being, and to see the way that we were uh, being in the world, you know, a way that got over the separation between us as subjects with the world in us, or us as mechanical something or others uh, functioning in the world. And then, uh, so first I could see that the AI people had got it wrong when they followed this one tendency in the tradition, namely to think of us all as rule-following rational uh, computers or animals, comes to the same thing at that point. And then after they, and I predicted as, as you know that it's all gonna fail, they've taken up, they took up the tradition in philosophy just at the moment when philosophers, particularly a philosopher named Wittgenstein, had undermined the tradition, and, and Heidegger of course too, they, beca they took up Descartes, and I knew they were going to fail, and then they did, so now we knew what human beings weren't, they weren't mechanisms, and they didn't have in them the kind of picture of a representation of the world. So then the question was, well, what are they? And then I learned more from reading Heidegger, namely that they are world-disclosing beings. That means that they are, if the, at their best, human beings are open to all kinds of possibilities, new situations, new aspects of the world, new ways it is to be a human being, and that it's their calling to respond to that, to take the risks of following out the solicitations that they get from the world, and thereby opening up whole new ways of uh, living of, and what opening up new things that you can see, even new moods that you can have, and that no machine can do that and no animals can do that. And this was done through skillful behavior. Okay, and, and yes, and the way they had to do it, and that's what the next thing I saw, of course, is that you have to become a master. You have to develop the skill of being a world discloser. It, just, it doesn't just come naturally, and that's what human beings, again, are called to do if they want to have meaningful, exciting, uh, uh, significant lives. They have to work at developing the skill, whether the, uh, the masters have to do it, but so do the cooks and so do the students, uh, of being open to wait, the wait, calling. Wait, so, don't say so the cooks and so the students. 
Not just the masters, but maybe the people who are around. That's what I just said. Should I say it? Should I say it? Okay. Not only the masters, but people who, when they see the masters, can be inspired to do in their own way the sort of things that the masters are doing. Perhaps not, of course not, totally disclosing a new world like Descartes did. I mean, it turned out to be a bad world, but he certainly did an amazing job of world disclosing. Then, or not doing it the way some, uh, the same uh, Dylan can do it when he switches from acoustic to uh, electric and changes the whole way that folk music or whatever kind of music he's doing is done. We can't all do that. But that fills us with uh, awe and we want to jump up and applaud and uh, say ole. But, but, e but, but each of us can do it in a lesser way, uh, but still opening up worlds. An intermediate stage we talk about is the sort of innovation of Fosbury flop, which makes a new technique and changes uh, high jumping to that extent and changes in a minor way, I think, the style of high, of high jumping. And then we can, there are pe people who can go, who don't even get that far, but who get somewhere, and people who go on to open up whole new worlds and change whole styles, all of that requires having skills and shared practices and communities of people who are working this out together, either inspired by the master or each one teaching the other or playing quartets together, however it happens to come out. And, and what's the risk of, uh, that we're in right now in, in our particular ah, age of losing? Okay, and then when, once you see the, the really possibilities of what human beings can do and are called to do, you see how dangerous this, our current situation is where technology is enabling people to have such comfortable lives and people are able to follow such simple rules as to how to use their microwaves and how to use their, their iPods that they don't have to learn to play music anymore, they don't have to learn how to cook anymore, and we would lose just this very essential, the essential thing about us, namely that we're world disclosers. So the only thing I could do was to pass on to my students this understanding of how important it is to be world disclosers and how dangerous, how the, the situation has never been more dangerous in our culture and certainly never been more dangerous in any culture because we're the culture that has a history of being. Most cultures stay sort of happily stuck at the poesis or the, or the fusis stage. And, 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 and so how do we, and what's the trick to, to, to making sure that that, that, that we preserve these practices. We can't just ignore what came before, right? What, what, where, do we, where, where are we going to find the examples yeah, of that's these right. practices? Well, well, yeah, that's right. Once you, one sees the danger and how the, the, the tradition has lost it step by step from Homeric uh, wonder and, and Homeric gods to believing in artificial intelligence, once you see that decline and the, the further possible decline into everybody just being technological and doing the standard thing, Thing in the standard way, then you have to find resources for resisting it. And lo and behold, philosophy has in it the resources for resisting it, namely in that epoch in the history of being when people realized that craftsmen and masters and artists were the human beings at their best and, and developed whole understanding of what it is to take the risk of responding to the calling to bring yourself and your situation and your cohorts all out at their best. And, st and we have to uh, understand this whole story of, of nurturing craftsmanship, bringing things out at their best. That's our source of resistance, and this is our last chance, because if we don't resist this one, we just become uh, technological zombies, and it's too late, and we can't go back. Good. <laughs> that was the result of chocolate. <laughs> That was the 75%. That yeah, was the 75%. that was my 75% conclusion. That was okay. That was very good. Good, okay, finally. I think, I think we got it. I think between those two, yeah, okay. Let's cut. Let's have lunch. <laughs>